Humans have been classifying organisms for a long time. Linnaeus, the famous founder of modern taxonomy, began characterizing organisms based on appearance. This is called the morphological species concept because morphology determines the groupings, but modern genetics has taught us that morphology can be very misleading, and many organisms that can look very different have very similar genes, or they might look very similar but have very different genes. And so one example would be these ants here members of the same species but clearly look very different because they're adapted for different tasks and then these birds which for a long time we thought were different species but they're actually a great example of sexual dimorphism where the male and the females look markedly different due to sexual selection so if we're going to talk about speciation we need to know what most researchers are using as the definition of a species. And that's actually a really tricky question for a number of reasons. First of all, speciation is slow. It happens gradually over a long time. At least it often does. So we might know of two populations that seem to be isolated and they seem to be diverging into different species, but when do we decide to call them a different species and not two populations of the same species? Secondly, we often accept that a defining characteristic of a species is that it's reproductively isolated from other species, but we're finding a lot of interesting exceptions now. Um, species that can reproduce and create hybrids, and then the hybrids have you know, different levels of fitness compared to their parents. Um, so we're going to talk more about hybrids and reproductive isolation in a little bit. The definition we're going to use was um, established in the 1940s, uh, but it doesn't work for asexually reproducing organisms. And right now, there's a whole lot of debate going on. Um, we have all these different species concepts um, that are different definitions of how we should define a species. Um, the one you would use if you were uh, researching in a certain biology field would be the one that your field generally accepts. But the one that's the standard high school definition of a species is um, the one established by Ernst Mayer. And so that is that species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. And often the actually or potentially is left out of textbooks, but that's actually a really, um, those are key words there, um, because it allows the definitions, the definition to work for populations that are actually mating or for populations that we believe would mate if they could mate. So going along with that would if they could idea, we're going to look at reproductive or So, sorry, hit the wrong button there. We're going to look at reproductive isolation from other populations, but the first thing you need to know is we're talking about a couple different sorts of isolation here. There's a number of ways to be reproductively isolated, so I want to start with the difference between allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation because they both can cause reproductive isolation or they both can form from reproductive isolation. But this is the big divide where it's just, 50, you know, not 50-50, but it's, it's going to be allopatric or sympatric. And so allopatric, sympatric, if you're starting with a population, say, in a lake, Populations that go through allopatric speciation have to be physically separated. So something, maybe a drought or a damming of a river that flows into this lake causes the lake to split into two lakes. So maybe there were two deep areas in the lake. The drying up causes them to separate. So now the fish on either side are split. They cannot cross to the other and through that sort of physical separation, um, they start to diverge into different species. With sympatric speciation, you don't need that physical separation. They can reside in the same area, but for one reason or another, they are not mating with other members of that nearby population, and so they start to diverge new traits, 
and into a new species right there in the same place. So allopatric, uh, short for allopatris, a different country, and sympatris, same country. So you can think of that as you try to remember, you know, what's going on. Is this allopatric speciation or sympatric speciation? But all speciation comes from some sort of reproductive isolation because whether populations are isolated physically or not you can look at how successful they are at breeding or interbreeding um, by looking at these barriers we're going to look at all different kinds um, and what barriers are is they keep the offspring from being born or from being successful reproducers because a new species cannot exist if its members cannot mate with each other successfully so um, if you've got two populations that can't breed with each other, they are two species. Um, if they are mating with each other, they are one species. So if we're looking at prezygotic barriers, you can see habitat isolation, where they are living in areas that don't overlap, like the two parts of the lake um, that are physically divided, or your book talked about snails being separated from from each other by roads. You can also have temporal isolation or time isolation. Um, that can be when they're active or simply when they mate. If their mating periods don't overlap, like with many insects, um, especially cicadas, the periodical cicadas that come out at different times, you cannot be a part of the same species if you're never allowed to mate with each other because of that timing. Uh, behavioral isolation means that your mating behaviors aren't recognized by a similar population and so um, we actually see a lot of birds that have the flashy courtship rituals they tend to um, have lots and lots of different species because that odd courtship element to their behavior and their lifestyle gives lots and lots of opportunities for this behavioral isolation whereas very similar species that mate for life won't have as many crazy characteristics and as many species because they have fewer opportunities to be isolated. Mechanical isolation simply means your reproductive organs are not compatible, so it's impossible for you to reproduce. Gametic isolation, that's the chemical form of reproductive isolation, so the sperm and the egg are not compatible at a cellular level, and they're not going to fuse together, so you'll have no fertilization. So that is all before the creation of a zygote, so it's pre-zygotic barriers. The post-zygotic barriers are things like hybrid infertility, so a common example is the mule. It's a hybrid of a horse and donkey, and it's what most of us think of when we think of hybrids. Um, but these are the hybrids that are infertile. Not all hybrids are infertile. Um, you can have low hybrid viability, um, which means your zygote is abnormal, and it can create fatal or severe consequences. So later on in adult life, you have a very low chance of mating, or maybe it prevents you from mating. You can also have um, that your adults are not as viable as a non-hybrid, so it survives easily to the juvenile and adult stages, but it's less fit for the environment, and so it's not going to thrive or survive as long as the other non-hybrid individuals, and so it won't have as much offspring, it won't contribute to the gene pool in the same way, and so that's another barrier to successful reproduction and seeing another um, group of individuals, another population that's different from the two species we're talking about interbreeding. If their hybrids are not able to reproduce, then those species are changing, those populations are changing into different species from that reproductive isolation.